thank you everyone for coming. And today we will be talking about GenAI's impact on open source. And when I say open source, it's you know all of that pipeline of great stuff that the community produces and the companies end up consuming. Uh, so my name is Roman. Uh, I wear multiple hats. Uh, so day job is you know co-founder of an AI company actually as of late. So talk to me about that. It's building a set of open source tools. Um, sort of think of us, you know, a little bit like maybe open source uh, hugging face uh, for AI. Uh, I also happen to be VP of Legal Affairs at the Apache Software Foundation and have been a hands-on contributor to a number of uh, big data projects in the Apache family. Uh, and uh, luckily, I actually have a lot of good friends in the Apache and Linux Foundation community. And a lot of the content that we produced, you know, to provide guidance for developers of how to use uh, Gen AI, and actually some of the content even in, uh, in this slide deck, uh, come from good people that I had a privilege to collaborate with. You know, two of them definitely deserve a shout out. Uh, Joanna Lee uh, from Linux Foundation uh, legal team uh, helped a lot, and Henry Yandel uh, at the ASF was also very instrumental to creating uh, a framework that we're going to discuss today. Uh, but before we do, since we're here at the Cassandra Summit, uh, let me actually start with the blog post. Uh, so everybody's talking about Gen AI, and you know, some people say that it will replace developers in you know, a couple of years. Some say that it will never replace a senior developer. Uh, basically, your opinion is as good as anybody else's. But here was a guy who was actually a very prolific contributor to Cassandra. Um, you know, you could say number one guy in Cassandra, you know, uh, even, who was basically very curious to see how Gen AI can basically make him even more productive than he already is. And let me tell you, again, I've known him through the community work that he's done. He is an extremely productive uh, coder, right? So he basically took a challenge of, you know, uh, getting a few Gen AI tools out for a spin, uh, and, you know, working on a real problem, you know, adding a vector search to Cassandra in six weeks. So he documented it all in his blog post, and I actually highly uh, recommend that you read it. Uh, there is a link, but you can just Google it, you know, the title is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, it basically talks about, what I like about it, it's, it talks about, you know, a really senior engineer's journey through the Gen AI tool set. Uh, and if you need to get an inspiration of how you can be, you know, more of a 10x engineer, you know, that's that's one of those. But the blog post was great, but what it turned out into is a legal Jira. And for those of you unfamiliar with how we do business in Apache, Apache is a software development, you know, organization. So everything we do, including, you know, legal things that we discuss, it's all mediated through Jira. So if anybody has, you know, a request, be it for code change or for clarification, it always ends up in a, uh, in a Jira. So we have a legal uh, side to Jira in Apache, and that blog post generated quite a discussion because at the end of the blog post, uh, Jonathan basically said that you know he's contributing a lot of work that he's done, you know, researching Gen AI tools uh, back to the community as he always does. But now the question is, well, whose code is it, right? You know, is it Jonathan's? Is it Gen AI's? Because you know he he go through all the various ways of how you would use you know one of those tools. Uh, but it's actually very unclear to the community of what to do about it, right? Do we accept it? Do we not accept it? What do we do? So again, if you're interested in a real uh, thoughtful discussion about how community views those types of problems, I highly recommend, again, Googling, you know, legal-656, or, you know, I'm sure the presentation will be made available, so you can, you can just click on it, uh, and just reading through the discussion, right, you know. But what is obvious from the discussion and what is obvious from the blog post is that at this point, the ship has sailed. It's not like you can stop Gen AI contributions. I mean, the open source community really took the red pill. And there is a reason why, because even if Jonathan basically tells you that Gen AI makes him you know, much more productive, you could imagine what it would do to a junior engineer, right? You know, not using those tools is just not an option. And especially if you're building something in the open, if you're building something in the community, you just kind of have to use those tools to basically stay ahead of the game or be your best self. Uh, now, when I talk about open source, especially for today's presentation, uh, I really mean a very particular kind of open source because, you know, open source can mean different things to different people. Like, 
Donald Knuth is doing tech as an open source project, but it's a very different open source project compared to Cassandra, right? So today we're talking about very specifically uh, software, mostly software, you know, we're not talking about uh, images or artwork or anything like that, uh, that basically evolves through peer-reviewed contributions. Right? It's not a software that you know, somebody sits on a mountain like Don Knuth and you know, just gives you updates now and again. It basically is very incrementally developed and very thoughtfully peer reviewed. Uh, the governance typically resides with a formal entity. So again, it's not some you know, random guy's project on GitHub. You know, that is interesting. I'm sure the guy uh, who has, or gal who has that project on GitHub would also benefit from Gen AI. Uh, but we're talking about more formal structure to the open source. So again, something like Cassandra within the Apache Software Foundation would totally qualify. Uh, and when we're talking about the, how the software itself gets developed, uh, we're very specifically focusing on kind of the following flow of the, of the contributions, right? So the contribution is developed. Uh, and it's a phase, right? You know, you can sit on it and develop it, uh, but then it gets submitted, then it gets reviewed, maybe you update it, you know, based on the feedback that you're receiving, and finally the contribution gets accepted. All those four phases basically have very specific uh, requirements for how you deal with things like intellectual property and, you know, attribution and licensing. So again, we will be going through them uh, in the presentation as well. Uh, and finally, when I say contribution, I actually do mean not just the source code, but anything that gets reflected in the source code form or in a form that ends up in a GitHub or you know, SVN repository. So it obviously could be source code. I mean, that just immediately comes to mind, but could be documentation, images. Again, Gen AI is pretty good at generating images these days. It could actually be blogs. Again, if you go back to Jonathan's uh, you know, uh, uh, world win tour of the Gen AI, you will see how he's sort of trying to use it for the blogging as well. But interestingly enough, it could be patents. You could actually use Gen AI to generate patents based on the code that you're producing. You could actually even use it to generate standard texts. And all of that will take form in your uh, repository. So again, we're not just talking about you know, your source code contributions. Uh, and uh, what I would like to highlight is that again, because it's so new, when we say Gen AI, you know, we all kind of assume a thing that we got introduced to, uh, but let's actually take a wider look. So if you look at how Gen AI is being consumed these days, it actually gets consumed in two different ways. Uh, obviously, there's a SaaS tool, right? You know, it could be GitHub Copilot or Amazon Whisper, you know, or uh, Code Whisper or anything like that. Uh, but it's basically something that you have no control over. You just hook it up to what you're doing. Uh, it gives you an output, you know, sometimes you can basically fine tune it to give you an output that is supposed to be only uh, taken from the, let's say, source code licensed by a particular license. So they're definitely knobs, but you don't really have insight into the model, you don't have an insight into, into how the tool works. Uh, and a lot of times when you don't, uh, things that we really take for granted these days, like EULAs, because who reads EULAs, right? Like I don't read EULAs, like nobody reads EULAs, because we kind of nowadays assume that, you know, if you have a EULA in place, it's not like they're going after you, right? You know, it's like, hey, maybe they will, you know, sell your data on, you know, to the highest bidder, you know, being an advertising company or something, but like they're not really going after you. Now with these tools, you really have to read the EULAs because these EULAs are very specific and a lot of times contain language that would be actually incompatible with the open source contribution. So for example, in the open AI, this is actually taken from uh, ChatGPT, uh, you may not use the services to develop foundation models or other large scale models that compete with open AI. That is the language literally in the tool that you're using. And if you're unfamiliar with that language, if you miss that language, obviously you might actually be in legal trouble, and then the question becomes, you know, who gets sued, who uh, does not get sued, but it still is a danger that you need to be aware of. Uh, EULAs in the Gen AI space, you know, I feel tend to be much less clear, uh, because again, as a developer, I'm used to like standard development, uh, developer tools like, you know, IntelliJ or, you know, Eclipse or whatever, right? And again, like it's pretty clear what they're trying to communicate to me. Here, uh, when I say unclear, it basically gets to the level of, remember, you know, maybe some of you remember, there used to be this software license called Don't Be Evil. You know, D Doug Crawford basically just as a joke, you know, put this license out with the JSON parser, saying like, you know, you can use my software for whatever, whatever you want, but just don't be evil. Now, organizations like Apache basically had to go out of uh, their way to ban 
you know, that piece of software, because again, don't be evil is just not a clear language, right? You know, it's not a language that you want to be uh, debated in court. Uh, now, if you talk about EULAs of the Gen AI products, they're actually full of that unclear language. So for example, again, uh, published content created in part using OpenAI may not be related to political campaigns, adult content, spam, hateful content, content that incite violence, and other uses that may cause social harm. Now, like sometimes, you know, discussions on the Apache mailing list feel like they may incite violence. So am I violating the EULAs, you know, when, I, when I'm sort of generating code and then, you know, that code gets discussed, like nobody really knows. But the point is, you know, pay attention to that. So these are the SAS tools, you know, they're kind of like in their category, they're well, very well known and, you know, the majority, I would say 80 to 90% of the time when you hear Gen AI, you will be talking about, you know, SAS tools. But nowadays they're actually standalone tools, you know, in a very traditional software development sense. Uh, tools like, again, JetBrains, uh, IntelliJ, and, you know, sort of that whole family of tooling uh, basically has Gen AI capabilities right now built in. What's interesting, again, everybody when uh, they're talking about Gen AI uh, is talking about uh, just generating code or artifacts. With IntelliJ, the tooling basically tries to help you throughout the software development cycle. So for example, when you see, uh, let's say an error message, you know, uh, sort of coming out of your compiler, or when you see like a particularly, you know, interesting debugging situation, a lot of times like a little knob would pop up, saying like, do you want AI to help you with that? If you click on it, you know, it's trying to basically do what we all do when we Google for like an unfamiliar error message, but it's sort of doing it, you know, through the AI tools. So again, it's not just generating the code, but it's also helping you as a software developer, which actually comes real handy a lot of times. But again, that is also under a certain EULA, although now it's applied to a standalone product. Finally, you actually can train your model from scratch. A few people try, it's very difficult, uh, so I probably wouldn't recommend you. But obviously, if you train your model from scratch, you know exactly what kind of data it got trained on, uh, and you have all the answers to like, what the tool would you know, get, give you back. Uh, a middle ground is basically fine-tuning an existing model, and again, I highly recommend this blog post from Hugging Face uh, called Personal Copilot. Uh, where they effectively took uh, one of the existing, you know, uh, code assistance, uh, Gen AI sort of uh, models available in the open source, and they effect uh, effectively fine-tuned it on a set of source that was unfamiliar to the model. Uh, and you can do that. You can basically make it give you the results that, let's say, align with your coding style or your team's, you know, coding style, so it doesn't really violate that. So there's a lot of, you know, uh, knobs that you can uh, uh, tweak that way. But again, if you do that, then, like, all bets are off. Because now, all of a sudden, you're taking something that basically got trained on a particular set of data, you're fine-tuning it on yet another set of data, and what it would give back to you, it's not even clear what legal terms that would be covered under, right? So again, it's fun to do, uh, but if you're trying to do it in production or for a big company, really talk to your legal advisor. Uh, but now that you, know, you have all these options, and GNII basically made you 10x of an engineer, uh, now it's time, like I told you, right? You know, you developed something, right? You know, you developed it in 10 times less, you know, uh, over time than you would typically do, right? You're all happy, but now it's time to contribute it back. And again, it's, uh, if it's just, you know, you're sending code to some other person's, you know, GitHub project, like not a lot of people think about what is the legal contract that that creates between you and that other person. And the answer is, you know, typically it's sort of license, uh, inbound license equals outbound license. So let's say if the project is covered by the Apache license, you know, your inbound contribution will also be covered by the Apache license. But it's actually unclear. Like, there's a lot of legal debate about, you know, how that needs to be clarified. The takeaway is that for all of the more formal, you know, uh, uh, projects within the governance of, let's say, Linux Foundation or Apache Software Foundation, we have clarified it by putting a particular document in place. And in the case of Apache, it typically is ICLA, Individual Contributor License Agreement, that has all of the language, you know, that is very uh, uh, relevant to a contract that gets created when something gets contributed back to the project. For example, there is, you know, section number five that basically says you represent that each of your contributions is your original creation. 
Now, again, if you just create it with Gen AI, are you violating the contract that you like literally signed? Because in order to contribute to any of the Apache project, if you're a, a, a PMC member or a, a committer, you actually have to have the ICLA on file with us, with an Apache Software Foundation. So you literally signed that contract with your own signature. It's not some implicit contract that got created. So are you violating that now? Well, let's talk about that. Uh, there's also uh, item number seven, uh, which is should you wish to submit work that is not your original creation, you may submit it to the foundation separately from your contribution and attribute it you know, accordingly. So again, if you're trying to separate what Gen AI gave you from what is really your creation, what are the guidelines that you need to follow? Because the contract itself already makes you follow those guidelines. Now again, a lot of the Linux Foundation projects, you know, they don't really use ICLAs, they use DCO, Developer Certificate of Origin. It also is, in, in a way, a very explicit contract. It also has problems with Gen AI. Uh, now, if you take a step back, if you think about, you know, all of these sort of contractual uh, obligations, why do we care, right? You know, why does ICLA specify the language that, you know, is very explicit about things being your original creation? Well, we care because the open source was literally made possible by the copyright. If the copyright doctrine didn't exist, we probably wouldn't have open source. Even back when you know, copyleft got created, copyleft was actually a clever hack around how to, circle, how to sort of leverage the copyright concepts in order to create the types of software that you know, we would all enjoy, right? But it still operated within the assumptions that copyright is this really important legal construct that we all need to understand. And the language that you see in ICLA is exactly there to protect you know, some of the copyright uh, uh, aspects of the work that you're contributing. Now, interesting, I'll just give you a few tidbits of kind of how to think about the problem space when it comes to copyright. Uh, so first of all, the good news is that uh, only the works made by human mind are copyrightable. So not anything that comes out of a machine or even animal so again, if you are not familiar with this, there's this famous ape selfie argument. So Google it. There was actually a lawsuit brought uh, uh, in you know, by a photographer who thought that the photographer has a copyright on pictures that were taken by an ape. Like ape literally would take a, a, a camera, sometimes take selfies, sometimes take pictures. Obviously the photographer who owned the camera and gave it to the ape thought that the photographer you know, has the copyright. Some people said, no, it's the ape who has the copyright. So there's actually a legal suit brought you know, uh, uh, in the United States, and the ruling is that ape cannot have a copyright, right? You know, only human mind can produce work that is copyrightable. It's a very useful uh, precedent you know, for anything that's generated by the AI. So by itself, AI recombining uh, the training data that it was given cannot really create copyrightable work. Uh, now, you as a human can basically take that and create a copyrightable work on top of that, but if all you're taking is that recombination of artifacts that AI is spewing back at you, it is not even copyrightable. That's actually the very interesting takeaway from all of this. It is not even copyrightable. Now, again, in a certain context, it might actually be good news, but it's just like, you know, pause for a second and appreciate that fact. Now, again, copyright actually has some rights, you know, that are obviously protected. Uh, but it also has some rights that are carved out, right? You know, so for example, even if you have a copyrightable work, uh, let's say it's a Disney movie or a song or something, right? You know, one of the just very clear example that we are all familiar with that is carved out is using it for, let's say, parody. So if you're parodying, you know, and the length of, you know, the original work is not too long, you know, even the Hollywood mafia will not come after you, right? Because that is a carved out chunk of the copyright that you can still use. So uh, it actually applies to the software as well, uh, in the sense that um, you can basically recombine some of the work to a certain extent, as long as it is not really, um, the expression is basically creative, right? So, and again, that's very interesting to me because what is creative? Like, is a single line of code creative? Like, do we measure it by the lines of code, by the complexity of the code? Like, how do we measure it? Some people say that, you know, if it's not creative, we can apply the exception. So even if AI produces something, that is not total recombination. Like, so suppose AI produced something that is completely, the world hasn't seen it. Well, that is not copyrightable. Like we've established that. That's kind of like an ape taking a selfie. Now, second case is AI can actually produce something that's just a copy of what it has seen before that has happened. Uh, but again, if it's small enough and it's not creative, 
then you can apply this uh, uh, exception saying like, well, even if it matches to some existing code like one to one, it's not recombination, it is not creative enough, therefore I can use it. Again, an analogy I would give you is we all know that we're not supposed to take uh, code from Stack Overflow because it's actually covered by a weird license and you know, like we're, we're not supposed to do that. Uh, but again, if it's just a single line of code, if it's not creative enough, uh, I think we are all within our rights to actually go ahead and take that single line of you know, code that we Googled. So it's kind of the same deal. Uh, and uh, we also have obviously corporate issues in training versus inference, right? Did the AI engine actually have the right to use the data that it got trained on? Well, only the maker of the tool can answer. Uh, versus you know, what came out of the tool and can you use it in your work? So these are the questions that are very useful to, uh, to answer. So again, you know, I'm talking so far and it sounds like you know, we've got 99 problems. Uh, and that is true, we do have a lot of questions that, that, that are unclear. And again, I just you know, stated a few here. Um, so uh, there are even other risks, right? Uh, there are things like you know, people basically copy paste proprietary data into chat GPT window because again, that's a SaaS tool, right? You know, it's like, if that tool has uh, a, a way of how you interact with it, like that's how you would do it. And if the data that you pasted, you know, contains some trade secrets, well, you might actually end up, you know, violating your corporate uh, uh, policy, and you know, th there will be some uh, level of trade secret loss. So there's obviously loss of privacy. Um, there's some, you know, concern about in turn, uh, intentional manipulation of AI models. You know, sort of like makers of the AI tools effectively steering the models to produce the output. So suppose you're a cryptographer, right? You know, you're working on some new cryptographic algorithm and you're using Gen AI tool to sort of like kind of help you with the mundane task of like, you know, writing for and while loops. But what do you know? Maybe it will just get injected with a subtle bug that all of a sudden the keys that you're generating are like less secure, but it's not obvious, you know, from just looking at the code. So that potentially could happen especially if you're using tools uh, that, again, are coming from unknown uh, state actors or maybe even well-known state actors, but well-known for their not following the international laws. There's a lot of uh, AI models coming out of you know, countries that are sort of uh, uh, on a gray list uh, these days. So again, that is also something that we all need to consider. And we're considering it because we cannot stand still. Uh, like I said, I mean, the, uh, 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 the ship has sailed. Whether we like it or not at the Apache Software Foundation, or Linux Foundation, or any big corporation, the developers will be using Gen AI because it makes them so much more productive. So what did we do? With Apache, at least, you know, we basically came up with a recommendation about you know, uh, six months ago. Uh, it's a very basic one. It's just the beginning. There was a blog post that we published, you know, uh, go read it up. It was created in sort of concert, in, in synchrony with Linux Foundation and some of the efforts uh, to help uh, one of their biggest communities, uh, which is uh, uh, Kubernetes, you know, to basically sort of figure out the same legal issues. So again, just go read it up. But there's still a lot of questions left, right? You know, the questions that are basically like that document even barely touches, but everybody's still asking. So if you go and keep looking at those legal jiras that I told you about, you will see people coming back and asking like these questions, right? Should we clearly mark all contributions created with Gen AI assistance? Like should that be made a policy within the Apache that if you're using one of those tools, at least in the commit message, you know, leave us a breadcrumb saying that like a particular tool was used. Now again, the stance that Apache is taking today is we are recommending it, but we're not enforcing it. But again, you know, we'll see how the whole field evolves and maybe at some point we will actually start enforcing it. Uh, another big question is how everything that we've described for an Apache developer dovetails into a corporate policy. Because you know what? Every big you know, 500 fortune company and then some now has a Gen AI policy for their internal developers, right? You know, what is permitted and what is not when they working on the proprietary closed source uh, uh, code base. So if it's completely asynchronous and you know, not really congruent with what Apache is doing, well, now you have a problem because you obviously have this huge supply chain of open source that's coming from the foundational side. And if it doesn't mesh well with internal corporate policies, well, now you're basically effectively getting cut off uh, from all of your favorite you know, open source libraries because again, there is a mismatch, right? You know, there is a gap and it, is, it would be incredibly difficult to bridge that gap because once the code is in uh, one of the big open source projects, it's pretty much next to impossible to isolate it, you know, get it out and, and, and whatnot. Um, 
so corporates take different stances you know, towards Chen AI. And again, here I just summarized some. Uh, it is, it is kind of a zoo. You know, and it is a zoo of you know risk uh, being risk averse. You know, um, some companies, for example, authorize use of generative AI only by developers with certain credentials. It's like you, you need to be this tall to ride this ride type of a situation. Like you basically need to qualify to be able to use Gen AI within the corporate setting. Uh, it gets to that level. Like I know companies that actually do that. Now again, at Apache, we don't do any of that. Uh, so what do we do? And again, this list is literally taken, taken from one of the Linux Foundation legal team presentations. Uh, it's very much the same for the Apache as well. Uh, so we basically were given a choice. As open source foundations, we could take most cautious approach. Uh, we can basically do it by use, maybe allow it, you know, if you're just debugging or, you know, you're sort of uh, uh, tinkering the code, but not like for the final contribution. We could have decided by the by uh, tool by tool basis, saying like you must use you know GitHub Copilot and nothing else. Uh, we could have just completely trusted the developer and say like do whatever you want. Not surprising that the approach that we took, you know, with, between Apache and Linux Foundation, now Eclipse is joining as well. So I think you know we'll see a coalition of these different types of open source foundations. Is trust the developer but provide the guidance. Uh, so for all use cases and all AI tools, for all projects, just publish the guidance uh, and give developers you know, the understanding of what they're dealing with. Because again, we don't really like reading legal contracts, right? You know, nobody likes that. Even if you signed ICLA, you are pretty much not really up to date with what you signed up for. So at least refresh the memory for developers, and that's what we're doing. So again, ASF sensor is actually published at this uh, ASF generative tooling guidance. So again, you can Google it, or once the presentation gets published, you can just click on it. Uh, it's a pretty clear list of what we can say to you today. And again, a lot of corporates came to me you know, afterwards and said thank you, uh, because they're now reusing this for the internal sort of, uh, at least as a starting point for the internal discussion, or sometimes even a set of policies for how they do it within the corporate setting. So again, it's a very useful list. It's constantly evolving, so you know, keep up, keep keep up with it. Uh, you know, refresh your page, <laughs> so to speak, now and again. Uh, it stands at version 1.0. I think we will do 1.1 with a few updates that people have suggested. You know, relatively soon. Uh, we are not anticipating 2.0 until you know the legal landscape or you know anything like that changes. Uh, and Gen AI is a very fast-moving target. Uh, you know, basically, you have changes in the law. Uh, Gen AI is one of the favorite, you know, subjects to all of not just the corporate, but basically the uh, uh, policymakers, right? So you now have policymakers of EU, you know, telling you something about Gen AI. I'm sure the policymakers of the United States will tell you something about Gen AI as a software developer as well. So that, of course, will apply to us. Because again, one little fact that we as software developers don't really appreciate is that law actually trumps our license. So if our license, for example, says that you know, it is provided to you without any kind of warranty, but all of a sudden Europe is making a law that warranty must be provided, your license is worthless. Well, you don't do business in Europe, but that's a separate issue, right? So law always trumps the license. And in this particular case, uh, legal landscape is very active, right? It's not like in the beginning of the open source movement where we got lucky and nobody noticed us until you know, we were pretty big and you know, could basically speak for ourselves. Uh, changes in tolerance for risk and ambiguity among adopters of OSS uh, are also changing, right? You know, some companies, especially when it comes to AI, get scared pretty easily because it's a big, big, big liability, just simply because, again, within the United States legal framework, everything is, you know, based on precedent. Not a single big precedent has been brought to court yet, but there will be. Like, I can guarantee you there will be, and nobody wants to be that first one. Uh, so there's a few additional you know, bullet points to consider. So uh, written guidance could also include a pre-approved list of AI tools. I mean, we don't really do that because again, that would be picking winners and we don't do that in the open source community. Uh, we could also maybe work with you know, things like SPDX a little bit more and sort of provide attributions and machine readable uh, sort of uh, uh, notion of what AI tool generated what. I actually want to talk to SPDX folks, you know, within Linux Foundation, you know, a little bit more. I don't think they're quite sort of catching up to that yet, but maybe there's some work uh, being done that I'm not aware of. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So thank you so much. We actually have uh, a workshop uh, and a panel also uh, today. 
uh, focused on what it means to produce open source AI. Uh, so these and some of the other questions, you know, will get discussed. So again, if you're curious about these subjects, you know, come to the panel uh, called uh, the definition of open uh, AI and the workshop that is done by OSI later today at I think 4:30. So thank you so much. <laughs>